Well, if you'll stand with me um, to kick this series on the life of David off, I've asked uh, Brother John Dyer to come and share about the life of David. He's not going to start the chronology. He's going to kind of, in general, talk about David and the character uh, of David and how God built that character. And uh, it's going to just kind of be something to whet your appetite so you can come to all these classes and learn about the life of David. So, Brother Dyer, come and minister to us here today. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, Praise the Lord again. Praise the Lord. All right, I'm just going to ask you all to say hallelujah. Can we say that? Say hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. I thank God. Y'all may be seated. I thank God for that. I say hallelujah only because God is worthy. You know, when you look at the word worship, it really comes from an old word called worth-ship. And if you really think about it, is he not worthy? This is an interactive sport. How many people watch sports? Anybody watch sports here? All right, young people. Oh, where's all the young people? Raise your hand real quick. If you're below 25, raise your hand. Has anybody ever seen their parents yell at the TV when someone's doing something wrong? In sports. Uh-oh, someone said hallelujah. And, you know, you see your parents and they wish they could actually be there in the sidelines coaching, right? They wish they could interact, right? You ever see that before? But this is the only place in life where you can actually interact. And it's not a spectator sport, if you will. You can't, you can't just do this thing by watching it. You got to be a part of it. So no one's going to get it out of you. No one can say, get up. I can't get a defibrillator and get you going. But I do that and I am the way I am because I interact with my God. Amen. There's another young man that I know of in life named David. And I always think of King David as a young man. I just, it goes back to that. And I just, you know, Brother, Brother Tremblay had mentioned some names earlier. So I'll just say this. Shorty. Runt. Troublemaker. Busybody. Nosy. Now, if you've been a little brother or a little sister, you've probably heard one of those names before, right? And if you've been a big brother, you probably said one of those things to your little brother or sister. And when you think about King David, you have to remember that even though he was King David, those are the names that he heard. And you can look at the interactions in the Bible between him and his family, and it was not favorable. When the man of God came to the house to pick the king, to anoint the king, he brought every other son before David. He said, don't you have any more children? He said, I, I got one more. And I want you to understand something. There's many times in life where we look at things and we are called names and we are beat down and we are made to feel like something that we are not. And it is up to us to respond. Amen. David had a response that I use in my life many times, no matter what the circumstances is. In Psalm 34, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in brother Savior's mouth. Long as it's in his mouth, we're all set. Long as his praise is in Joey's mouth, we're good. But David said, in my mouth. In my mouth. I look at King David, and I'm often thinking about this, as, as Pastor said this, about character. And I think and praise God for the opportunity to do this. But character is something that can be defined in many different ways. And if you take a look at uh, some of the definitions, as applied to an actor, it deals with the persona or personality that he or she portrays in a production. Um, if you apply it to uh, writing, it could be A, B, C, D. Those are characters. But the noun of a character is the aggregate of features and traits that form an individual's nature of some person or thing. I kind of look at it like this. You know, we say now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Amen? You can't. It's intangible. But a person's character is the part of them that you can't touch but still makes who they are. And as we look at the life of David, you have to understand that David had a character that was distinct. It was something that God noticed. But he didn't notice David on the stage. He didn't notice David running that 100-yard dash faster than everybody else. He didn't notice David in front of his peers as standing head and shoulders above the rest. He noticed David way on the mountainside by himself when he was alone doing a job that most people look down upon. So we look at David, and the Bible says in Luke 6, 43 through, 30 through 45, For a good tree bringeth forth not corrupt fruit, neither doth corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. 
For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart the mount speaketh. What's in your heart will be shown by what you speak. It'll be shown by what you do. You can say whatever you want. You can say, I can say whatever I want, but it's coming out of me somehow, some kind of way. And David was a man that was preceded by his reputation. When I was younger and we, I was a part of a church and I was out witnessing, evangelizing, and I saw a young man and he was in a supermarket. cameras on him, but he did it with a diligence and a fervency that I remarked at. I'm not even, I'm not a supermarket guy. I don't know how a supermarket works. I just saw the diligence there. God spoke to me and said, if he can work like that to stop and stop, what can he do for me? And I saw that young man bring, if not 50s, hundreds of people to church. I saw him come in and I saw him give his life to God and God used him in such a way that he stood up from his pew. He didn't have more money than them. He wasn't talking to them. He had a heart. That God saw. And I want to say and suggest to you, it's not where you're going, but where you are right now. It's not about the place that you're dreaming of, right? Someday is not a part of the week. There's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There's no some, someday. Right. But where you are right now, you're making the difference there. And David made the difference where he was and was diligent with the lambs that he had. Amen? So we look at David's life, and, and, and David had many grand victories, and it's hard to say David without saying, what's the other word that always comes up when you say David? Goliath. It's hard to think of this situation where this little boy was before the giant and say, like, it's hard not to go, wow. And when you're faced with problems, Elder, they say it's like a David-Goliath situation, right? David embodied that, and David lived that, but David wasn't preparing uh, to be seen of people, he wanted to care for the responsibilities and duties he had. David had a heart after God in the sense that David had a soft and a tender heart for the things that were before him. He cared about the things God gave him. He respected the people around him. He had a humble heart, and God saw that. Now, it's hard not to understand why God chose David in the sense that when you look at David, I mean, he was a, 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 a good-looking young man. I mean, he worked hard. You can look at that alone and say, that's why God picked David, but that's not why he picked him. He saw his heart. And so now, when the people of Israel, you remember at this time, I don't know if you know this, and you know, you look at the country and we all say, man, give us a president that does this. Have you ever heard that when the election time's coming up? And everybody's going to say, we only had a president to do this. The Bible says that they were both to keep the law, the people and the king. It wasn't good enough for the king to keep the law alone. The people had to keep the law. But let me say this. If the king wouldn't keep the law, it was hard for the people because that was the example. And David had a heart for God, and he was inspiring. And when people got around him, they felt like worshiping God too. You couldn't sit in a service with David and keep your hands folded. David might look at you and say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> David danced so hard for God, his clothes fell off. And people thought he was crazy. And young people, let me say this to all of you right now. The character of David that you need to see the most if you're young is this. He wasn't afraid to be embarrassed. He wasn't afraid to be the one that was weird. He was weird. He was a sheep boy. He was little. And he came out to a giant with a slingshot. That's not weird. I don't know what is. But David's character really was about his relationship with God. And it's hard not to look at that without seeing the person that was not like God. Because David had a heart after God, and there was a king that did not have a heart after God. And the king that didn't have a heart after God was Saul. Saul was before David and was chosen simply because he was so good looking. The people wanted him. If you look at the family of Saul, he had a prominent family. Those were the Kennedys of the time, if you will. Saul didn't come from the bottom of the back. David did. And when Saul came about, I want you to understand something. I'm going to look at this real quick. This is Acts 13, 21. Thank you, brother. I'm sorry about that. This is Acts 13, 21 through 23. 
And afterward they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed them, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all of my will. Of this man's seed, at God, according to his promise, raised us, raised unto Israel a savior. No one could really tell what was in Saul or David's heart by looking at them. It was by their actions. And what I'd like to suggest to you is this. When the rubber meets the road and we love God and we're confronted with something that's wrong, how do we react? This is the true test of David. And this is the true test of Saul. Saul had sinned before God to the extent that God was willing to take the kingdom from him. I don't know if you've ever been fired, but anybody ever been fired before? It's not a good feeling. If you haven't been there, you're going to get there one of these days probably, if you're young still. It's not a good feeling when someone takes responsibility from you, when someone says your services are no longer required. It's a long walk to the car. Friday afternoon, you run to that car. You can't wait to get it. Woo! It's Friday. You leave, right? And it seems like that walk is, 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 is five seconds. But when you get fired, that's a long walk. The same walk you've been making the last year is, oh, you get it done in five seconds. It's about 10 hours as your coworkers look at you. Saul was confronted by the prophet Samuel. And Saul's answer was, this is 1 Samuel 15, 30 through 31. Then he said, I have sinned. Oh, I want y'all to see this. This plagues me. This one, this one line plagues me. I have sinned. He didn't deny that he sinned. Yet, honor me now. I know I sin. I just don't want them to know. Really doesn't make a difference what he says. They don't need to know. I got a name to protect. I pray thee before the elders of my people. And before Israel, turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. How do you go before God and worship knowing that you've sinned and he's rejected you? And you've not one bit of repentance in your heart. The difference between David and Saul was that Saul had no repentance in him. David had a character, no matter how bad it was, no matter how good it was, he loved God, and his relationship with God was more important than anything else. Young people, I can't tell you enough. What, what is distracting to you now is going to be regret later on in your life because you have an opportunity to know God. And some of the people that are distracting you will come to know God and say, I don't know why you left this. But I look at David, man after God's own heart. He had a heart of repentance. Psalm 51, if we could pull that up. This really embodies the character of David in the difference between him and many people. David was a mighty man of God. David did great exploits. The Bible says that by the spirit of God, he was able to run through a troop. He was able to defeat giants destroyed nations that were enemies of God. David would pray prayers against people that were against God. David loved God with his whole heart. That worship, that joy was in him. It was just working inside of him. No one had to inspire it. He inspired. He loved God with his whole heart because he knew that God was worthy of his adoration and his worship. In Psalm 51, when he was approached with his sin, and it didn't actually chronologically happen the same way, but this is written at the same time. He said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out, blot not out my transgressions. David continues to go to the next verse here. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Iniquity is willful sin. Iniquity is when you just say, I'm doing it anyway. It's not just sin. You could sin. I could step on your shoe. Maybe I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. But I see that shoe and I've willfully done it. Now, I'm not trying to be comical, but I'll say this. You could step on the word of God, trample it, if you will. 
You have such a disdain for God and his ways that God can't reach you. When God speaks to you and you now rebuke it, that's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. If I have water, you're dying of thirst and you refuse the water from me and you die, I can't help you. That's why we can't blaspheme God. But Saul was that way. David was not. Verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. I know it's there. I acknowledge it, Lord. He asked to be cleansed, though. He repented. Now, I want you to get down. I think it's about verse 6 or 7. Behold, thou desire truth in the inward part, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Lord, it doesn't make a difference what they know about me. I want to be true to you. I want this thing to keep working. I want this feeling. I want this joy. Verse 8. And I might be wrong on it. I think every one of us grown up at church at one point, most of us have been in church, and you lift your hands and you worship and you sing your joy songs. But it's got to be yours. And when David was at that place where he no longer had it, he asked God for it again. Saul didn't care about that. David said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I want to say that's verse 9. It's somewhere in there. Verse 8 of it, verse 9. I'm looking at there. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. There's a liberty in worshiping God, even though you've made a mistake. And even though people have seen you mess up, there's a liberty in knowing you've got it right with your Savior. And if there's one character that you understand, one trait about David, King David, that you need to know it was just that. His relationship with God was paramount. Even though David was king, God was always king to David. Whereas Saul was king. And that was it. So I give you the review of David for you to understand this. David's relationship with God was the most important thing in his life. And that caused him to have joy. And if you look, verse 12. Verse 12. I mean, verse 13. Because that relationship was always maintained, and because he could go back to that, then he could teach transgressors. It wasn't just about him being happy with Jesus. It was about him living a life in such a way where he could inspire other people to want the same thing. I want what you have. You go back through that Bible when David ran from Saul. All the downhearted, all the cast, the, the cast out, all the broken people. You know who they went with? You know who they got with? They got with David. They said, man, you got something we need. You know God like these people don't know God. David was an inspiration because David didn't let his relationship with God die. That's my review. I'm going to close. I don't want to take up too much time. But I wonder if you could stand up for a moment. If we could say this together. Everybody stand up. And forget the people around you for a moment. Forget mom or your daddy. Forget cousin, nephew, whoever you, who, whoever you came with. I want you to close your eyes and say, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, Lord God. Let it flow in me, Lord God, once again, Lord God. Consume me with your presence, Lord God, until I die unto myself, Lord God. Restore unto me the rivers of living water that you imparted to me, Lord God. Let them bubble up and flow again, Lord Jesus. I may teach others your ways, oh God. Hallelujah. We love you, God. We desire to do you, Jesus. We want the character. We want the relationship with you that's real, that's alive, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, that was a great summary. Uh, and, and it brings up a very important point that you heard many times, and all of you know this, but it's good probably to hear from time to time, is that what we're doing here is not trying to please the world. We're not trying to put something together that everybody likes. We're trying to be a character based we're trying to be truth based and that means there's going to be some people that just love it because they want that and there's going to be other people that it makes them uncomfortable they don't want to go real they don't want to go deep they don't want to really make it about god so the church becomes a wonderful place that some people that flesh does not like so you're going to get mixed emotions in church People are going to love some things about it, but our flesh is going to really detest some things about it. And so some people uh, 
rec will recognize what a great thing it is, and other people will say, you know, I'm going to go somewhere where it's fun or where it's enjoyable, where people aren't so judgmental or all that kind of thing. And uh, that's why it's always a mixed bag when people look at even good churches because that's the spirit and the flesh going back and forth. Character is when our flesh can be what the spirit is calling us to be. And that's a tough thing to do. You may be seated. Uh, last Thursday and Friday, my wife and I and Dennis and Tim went down to Maryland. We were part of the Northeast Regional Prayer Conference called Summons to Sacrifice. Uh, it's the first time World Network of Prayer, which is the international arm of our organization that focuses on prayer, they have a, a website. They send out prayer requests to everybody who gives them their email. So uh, if you have a need, you put it on World Network of Prayer. There's hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who are able to tap into that and pray for that. So uh, they have a conference every year. They have several now. And we met Brother Libby's church. We heard a couple great sermons that I probably will be showing in the next couple of months because they're so powerful and significant, but there was probably, I don't know, six or 800 people who were there for some of the services, and we not only heard sermons, but we actually prayed for uh, pre-service prayer. There was a half hour, and then during the service, we prayed, kind of like our prayer groups, about half the time was prayer, and there was just some very significant things that happened. I'm going to mention a couple of them. One of them I mentioned last night, for those of you that were here, uh, that is that Brother Kleindienst, who Brother Stone King was supposed to speak, Brother Stone King was sick, so Brother Kleindienst spoke instead, and he just mentioned to me personally that he's seen 877,000 people filled with the Holy Ghost in his lifetime, and so he's been around the world, he's been to major revivals in Pakistan, Ethiopia, there's just all kinds of people, in fact, somebody mentioned what several of you sent around on Facebook recently, that uh, there's so many people that are coming into this experience of speaking in tongues that uh, the, one of the major Baptist denominations has now made it legal, if you want to put it that way, for their missionaries to speak in tongues. There's so many people in South America and Africa that are being filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues that whole organizations are making room for that and saying, well, we recognize that this is a move of God. And... Uh, he's seen this all over the world, hundreds of thousands of people. But he said he loves coming to the East Coast because there's a spirit of revival. He said there's not very many numbers right now, but there's an attitude of revival. And in, in fact, somebody told me that years ago, Brother Stone King mentioned this. I think Dennis said this. Brother Stone King is an international evangelist. He's also seen many people around the world uh, healed and filled with the Holy Ghost. But he <clears throat> bought a house years ago over in upstate New York because he said he felt like the next major move of God that was going to happen in the United States was going to happen in New England. Now, uh, I don't know how that works. I don't know if God offers it everywhere and whoever takes him up on it, he's able to do it. But I was very encouraged that our whole movement thinks that something's happening in this part of the world, and so they put a regional summons to sacrifice, and next year they're going to come back to this region, and then there's a prayer team that's going to come to Ansonia in July and pray for that home missions work that's starting there. So uh, it's like other people from outside this region are beginning to recognize what you and I were told by God would happen, and we've been praying for. I'm telling you that because sometimes you don't see and sometimes you don't recognize the walls that are coming down. Sometimes we don't see the results we want to see right here, but we need to pay attention to those kind of things. God is doing something spectacular. And these people came to Washington, D.C., and one of their main objectives was yesterday they were going to do a prayer walk in Washington, D.C., and they had at least five buses of people that were... Uh, at that time signed up. So I don't know, several hundred people were going to be walking, walking around Washington, D.C. During one of our prayer times, Brother Hudson, who is the superintendent of the West Virginia district, who's leading this prayer walk, said that he, uh, he prayed for Washington and he saw a whole contingent of angels 
moving that way. Sister Shaw said she gave two or three instances where prophetically God has spoken through different people and said that uh, Michael the Archangel would be going with that group of people to Washington, D.C. Our nation is a pivotal point, and it's up to God and people, but right now I believe God's given America a chance to turn back. If we don't, we're, it's very clear the handwriting's on the wall. But uh, there's still room for America to do the right thing. All it would take would be for a few Supreme Court justices to get their heads screwed on straight, and it could change the whole course of our, our nation. So we prayed for the Supreme Court, and we prayed for our president and vice president. We prayed for the next president, whoever that is, because God tells us to do that. And we're not being partisan about that. We just want God to help us to, to have some godly leaders. I shared a couple of prayers that G General Washington and President Washington prayed and uh, reminded everyone that the reason America is so great is because it was founded on prayer and some good principles. All we need to do is shift back to some of that, and uh, we probably wouldn't have so much killing in our streets and so much uprising to our government and things like that. If we would be under government, maybe more people in our, in our cities would be under government. Uh, so it was such a, an, an important and exciting time, such a, a groundbreaking, several people call it historical time, that I felt it would be good instead of me preaching today just to let those who attended share a few things that stuck out to them so you can kind of be pulled in and you can be blessed by that conference and uh, vicariously experience some of what they experienced. So I'm going to let my wife say anything she wants to say about what she picked up or what God said to her. It was a very encouraging time. Awesome, powerful prayer meetings. And it made me be appreciative to live in this time because this is the time whenever we're going to see the former and the latter rain that the Bible talks about in the great, great harvest that God has said he's going to reap in this earth. You and I get to be part of that. And I believe it's going to be greater than the book of Acts. It may come with persecution, but we get to be part of that. And um, to be honest, I didn't really want to go because of the long trip. <laughs> I'm just being perfectly honest here. And God kept prompting me. And I went with a specific question and a struggle that I've been having. And, you know, uh, things that we've heard. But my question to God was, how do I have joy? And how do I have all this junk in my life at the same time? How do I find that combination? Because I know you, you want me to live an abundant life. Yeah. But I tend as a human to focus on the negative and the problems and the issues and all of that. And then I don't have my joy because I'm so overwhelmed by my problems and my issues. And then I don't have strength because the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? So it sounds weird, I know, but God answered my question when I went. He had several sermons preached along that line. But then uh, the last session that we were in, Brother Libby got up and, and he I'm just going to tell you very uh, simply how it, he explained it and how it went to my head because I, I'm simple. But he talked about transcending your problems and how you do that is in worship. Very simple, right? And you, ha you have a choice of how you're going to look at a situation. When you're faced with a circumstance, you can get involved in all the negative parts of that and let it beat you down and let it worry you and let it discourage you. Or you can say, God, you were over everything. You knew this problem was going to come to my life, and you knew um, that I was going to struggle with it, but I'm just going to choose right now that I'm going to thank you for all the good things that I can see in this situation instead of focusing totally on the negative things and being worried and remembering who I am. I'm a child of God. So I have the power of God in me, and God is over everything, so there's nothing too hard for God. He can overwhelm this situation if he chooses to, but if he doesn't, he'll give me the grace to go through it and to grow through that. And that was the other point of the sermon is that God is not arbitrary. He doesn't just send things just like he's mad at you, so he sends this bad thing into your life. It's that God wants you to grow as a Christian. So he brings things to your life to help you to grow. So that circumstance that you're struggling with right now, 
Maybe God put that in your life because you need to stretch. You need to get some muscles in that area of your life. So instead of looking at it like, oh, my life is horrible and now I have another problem, we can look at it like, God, you are so good to me that you are allowing, you are trusting me to go through this situation and to grow through it and to come through different, changed, better, so that I have something to give out to somebody else. And that's the whole point of the Christian walk is that I keep growing so that I have something in me whenever I'm in a, a situation or I meet someone, then that comes up in my spirit because God put it there for that reason. And it's all about God. Everything is about God. You know, I lose sight of that all the time. I, I get so involved in my own little life, but there's a huge world out there that God's over. It's, it's all about God. My life is supposed to be all about God, and I need to get that focus, and I need to be reminded of that constantly, that my life here is just a little, little part of what my whole life is going to be. My whole life is going to be spent with God for eternity. I, I'm, I'm planning on going there, but... This life is really about God. Everything that God is doing, it's his kingdom. We say that all the time, but then we forget. It really is God's kingdom. It's not my kingdom. My life is just, should be found in him. So I'm thankful that God, he, he just ministers to me all the time. Does he do that for you? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right. If you'll stand, we want to sing a chorus here and just chew and swallow a bit before Tim and Dennis come and share what they learned. Uh, Brother Libby, for those of you who know him, he's just, he's just a character. He's funny. And uh, the way he dealt with this, he, he used the scripture, said, you shall have tribulation. You know, and he said, you know, it's going to happen. And, said, and uh, if, if you just came out of one, you're probably going into another one. And there'll probably be, some of you are probably tribulating right now. And he, wow. he just... Uh, just get over it. Instead of seeking that place in life where there's no problems, which nobody lives there, absolutely nobody lives there, except people maybe whose head are in the sand. Nobody lives there. God's going to give us consolation. You can have tribulation and consolation all at the same time. It's just worshiping, as she just said we need to do. my my uh, summary of this meeting with just a little foundation um, on a personal level for me uh, a month or two ago Michelle and I were at our Burlington Coat Factory in Worcester buying some stuff and a com uh, complete stranger his name is Seth from Ghana I gave him an Acts 2 Ministries flyers how the, that's how the um, conversation started and he Turned out to be some sort of a Christian. I don't know where he goes to church, but the way he was talking, he has the Holy Ghost. And a complete stranger, and we were talking for a while, and he said several things to me. And I ran all this by Bishop Hansen after. I believe he prophesied to me. One, I'm just going to share one thing he told me. He said, God is going to take care of everything. Just keep moving forward. So, fast forward to, well, for the last three months, four months, I've been working on three broken down vehicles at my house like perpetually I had to fix all three of them and that takes a lot of time energy it just saps you if you ever worked on cars and when we heard about someone's to sacrifice instantly I just I thought I'd like to go to that I don't know why I thought that I, I just thought I think I want to go so long story short I bounced it back and forth between Bishop Hansen and me and it literally went back and forth. We were going to go, then we weren't going to go. Then we were going to go. And then I got an email from him. He said, you know what? We're, we're preparing for the move and everything. I, I don't think we'll go. I said, okay, that's fine with me. Because well, they're supposed to come to Pro Providence next week, uh, next year. So I decided, okay. And I remember going into work that day that he sent, the day after he sent that email. And I, as I'm entering the door of my job, 
I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, I thought I wanted to go. I thought you wanted me to go, but I guess I'm not going. And then I said, as of yet. The same day, I get another email from Brother Hanson saying, you know what, we're going to go. <laughs> and then if you can find someone else to go with you. So I asked several guys, came up with three strikes. So, but then the day, like the Sunday, last Sunday, Dennis comes up to me. He was one of the strikes. He said he wasn't going to go. But then he changed his mind and he came. So it was ordained of God that we go. Um, oh, another thing, God provides, God takes care of everything. The day before we left, my hot water heater died in my house. You kind of need hot water occasionally. I tried to take a cold shower. It doesn't work. <laughs> so I prayed to the Lord this way. Lord, I pray that I can get this fixed quickly, easily, and inexpensively. I just, I, I'm going to summons, Lord. This is your, I'm casting my cares upon you. I can't mention any details. I'm just going to show you what God did. As we're driving to summons to sacrifice, it was a nine-hour drive, including the stop for supper. I get a text from Michelle with a picture of a brand new water heater sitting on my front porch. Then Thursday night, when we were leaving, or whatever night, we were leaving to come home, I get a text from my wife saying the water heater is all installed. And then I ask how much was it, and the answer was zero. Now, I, I, I'd like to expect that, I can expect that every time, but I don't know. I just thank God abundantly for that, and I pray a great blessing on the ones God used. But, so we went to summons to sacrifice. Dennis and I were treated like queens, we, uh, queens, kings. <laughs> we, pay, <laughs> we paid nothing for gas to get there. We paid nothing for two nights in a beautiful hotel. The Hansons fed us at, at uh, uh, that steak place there, Longhorn Steakhouse. I was like, how can I get this much and not feel guilty? This is like, why is God giving me so much? But I thought back to where the Lord said, don't worry about anything. I'm going to take care of everything, but keep moving forward. And that's the key, church. We have to keep moving forward. This church is like a, a hot rod full of high-octane gas. I mean, full. The only thing is, we've got to turn the key, we've got to start the engine, and we've got to step on the gas pedal. And we're doing that. We are doing that, and we're going to do it more. But I believe God's bringing this church, and, and I'm not talking as your pastor, just an elder. Uh, God's bringing this church to a place where the key is going to be on, and this church is going to move forward like never before. So th there were several speakers at Summons to Sacrifice. The first one was Bishop Wright. And I remember when I heard I was going, I heard it's going to be Brother Wright and Brother Stone King. I'm thinking, wow, it's going to be double barrel. It's like, because those two guys, Brother Wright only serves like meat. And he, he, he started with what was, to me, a, a little bit controversial statement. He said, God is not eternal. And I said, what do you mean God's not eternal? But he explained what he meant. God is infinite. He never had a beginning. He'll never have an end. He's everywhere at all time. We're eternal. We had a beginning. We have a soul which God made. God, the God that is going to give a revival today is the God that existed before he even made the earth. Maybe we'll be listening to Brother Wright sometime. I don't know. But then we heard Sister Shaw, who I had never met before. And she told about um, the Lord showing her how he was going to send Michael the Archangel to Washington, D.C. I don't know if you're going to see that on the news tomorrow or what, but <laughs> God did that. God sent, and, and it reminded me of when the Lord spoke here one time, and he said that he was sending angels out before us. We're laboring with God in this harvest, and it's going to be unbelievable what God's going to do. There was other speakers. Sister Shaw's husband spoke. He's also a police officer and a pastor, which to me is like, how do you, how do you even do both? But somehow he does them. Um, and then 
Brother Stone King wasn't able to be there because he was ill, but Brother Kleindance came, and the Lord gave him a word. The day before, he was in Florida, and then the Lord sent him up to Maryland to preach to us about the hour in which we live, and that there is an opportunity right now for the church that's not always going to be here, and it's our obligation to step into that opportunity so as a visual, now, uh, there's a lot more I can say about the meeting, but I just feel impressed to share what God gave me personally. I was just one of 800 people in the crowd. But, and then we're going to pray. But I'd like the ushers, if they, I'd like everyone to turn around and look at the doors coming into this church. I'd like the ushers to swing those two doors open and hold them open. And then I'd like Bishop Hansen to go and open the main door coming into the sanctuary. Take a good look at those doors. The ushers, you can hold those two doors open. If we could lock, maybe swing those two doors locked open. Take a look out there. And think of Noah's Ark. When they were building the Ark, 120 years, the door was open. The world was being preached to by a man of righteousness, warning them that there's a flood coming. Get ready. They mocked Noah. They made fun of Noah. They ridiculed Noah. Noah kept preaching. There's a flood coming. Get ready. And the Bible says that for 120 years he built the ark. And then one day, all of a sudden, over the hillside come animals, two by two, a couple of goats couple sheep, a couple elephant, giraffes, just a train of animals. And I'm sure the people looked at that train thinking, was there going to be a zoo in town, a parade? What's going on, Noah? And Noah just kept preaching. You know what? There's a flood coming. Get ready. And the doors were open. But the Bible says when that flood, when God said it's time for the flood to come, Noah didn't close the door. God closed the door. So church, there is a revival coming. There is a harvest coming that this building is not going to contain. The <laughs> Brother Libby's church, which I had never been to before, it's, it's out in the sticks, kind of like this one, but it's humongous. It's got 20 acres of land or so. It's got a 60-foot high ceiling in the vestibule. It's huge. Brother Libby's been pastoring there for 41 years. This church in the next year or two, we'll hit its 40th year mark. I told Brother Hanson, I said, God, 40 years is important to God. It makes me wonder what in the 40th year of this church is going to happen. Is God going to start bringing the flood that he's been telling is coming into this place where this place, you know, we've outgrown all the other buildings. I don't, I don't believe we're going to house what God's going to do. But eventually, the door is going to be closed. You can close the doors. And they're going to be closed by God. God's going to say, the season's over. That's what Brother Kleindance preached that night, was about the season of harvest. So, God brought this to a personal level for me. I've been in, this, in the church for 38 years. And I, I've seen this church go from... Pastor Hart's kitchen to what it is here now three buildings later but I look at my life personally and the Lord had me look at my life that night at summons in prayer and I, I, I looked behind me in the spirit and said where's all the souls where's all the why is God giving me the Holy Ghost why do I have so much anointing why do I have such a great bishop? Why do I have such a comfortable building? Why do I have a free water heater? Why do I have a house? Why do I have a promised child? Why do I have on and on and on and on? And, and, and the Lord gave me that verse, to whom much is given, much is required. And, and in the spirit, I look behind my life, and I can see a, a small trickle of people that I've influenced, that I've affected. I've baptized several people. Most of them, I don't even know where they are today. 
I've taught a few Bible studies, but in comparison to what God has done for me, it's nothing. But the Lord didn't show me that to discourage me, because if you're discouraged, you can't move forward. He showed that to me really to adjust my perspective. That, you know what, I can't bring this harvest that God's going to bring. But I can work with God and be a part of it. I can be, and then I felt like the Lord said, everyone in my church has the potential to have thousands of souls following them. I don't want to get to, the, to heaven after however many years I live here on earth, God knows, and just show up and say, hi, Jesus, you know, thank you for such a beautiful, blessed life. Thank you for everything you lavished upon me. Thank you for every, every, every anointing you gave me, every gift you gave me. Thank you so much, Jesus. It was so awesome. Now I can live with you forever and turn around and there's nobody with me. There's no other souls. There's, there's no coworkers. There's no family members. There's no neighbors. There's no people I walk in the market with. It's just, thank you, Jesus. I made it. Thank you so much. I had an abundant life that you promised me I could have. And now I'm entering into eternal life with you. Thank you so much, Jesus. In, in the spirit, I saw just an empty, an empty train. And as we stand and come, we're going to pray. If you want to labor together with God in this harvest, I want to ask you to come here up front. If you don't want to labor with God in the harvest, you don't have to come up. But God wants to talk to his laborers. What more does this church need to do what God has called us to do? What more could God put in our gas tank? What more could God say to us? How many more tongues and interpretation? How many more prophecies? How many more visiting ministers confirming God's word? How many more gifts of the Spirit could God repeat over and over and over again? what he wants to do through you individually, through me, through his church. The doors are open, but there are thousands. The Lord has said this. There are, they are coming by the thousands. We're going to pray. And I'm, I, the Lord said, don't have anybody pray for anybody. Just have everybody stand before me as the Lord of the harvest the Lord of the harvest. The harvest that's out there, not in here right now. I'd like you to close your eyes and picture in your own life two things. One, you looking behind in your life and seeing how many people are following you as you follow Jesus. But don't let that discourage you. Now picture in the spirit God putting a huge basket of seed in your hand. That seed is the word of God. That seed is your testimony. That seed is a Bible study. That seed is a phone call. That seed is a prayer. Picture a, a huge basket of seed. And then turn from looking behind you and look forward in the spirit and place your hands on the plow. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Don't look back anymore. Just place your hands on the plow. And think of this. He that plants is nothing. He that waters is nothing. That's what God did for me. Because, like I said, I've been in this church for 38 years and I... I could get a complex about that. I carry the title elder. whoop de doo Jesus doesn't really care about titles. He doesn't care if you carry the title deacon, minister, whatever. What the Lord is looking for is obedience. And God helped me to see myself as, you know, I'm not as important as I want to think I am. The Bible says if he that plants is nothing. Now, God's not demeaning us. God's not ridiculing or abasing us. God is giving us perspective. This is his harvest that he wants reached. 
These are his fields that he's sending us into. That seed is his word. That Holy Ghost he's going to pour out is his power. What, what God is going to do in the spirit that we've never seen before, it's going to be his glory. But he has called and chosen to use you and me. Do you want to stand before him on that day with no one following you? God is, God is beckoning to his laborers. I don't know if there's anything else he could say. I think Brian said it at his last meeting. There's a field of angels out there just waiting for the laborers. Where are the laborers? You're the laborers. That's what God did for me. And I asked God, I said, how in the world, Lord, do I repay you? Not only for all the material blessings I've had, the daughter you gave me, the wife you gave me, the Holy Ghost. How do I repay you, Lord? And he just said, go win souls. So let's talk. I'm going to pray, but I ask you to, to close your eyes and talk right to the Lord of the harvest. And see what he would say to your heart. Lord Jesus, God, we stand before you today as your sons and your daughters as your laborers Jesus that you have commissioned that you have empowered that you have given us the power to be your witnesses we stand before a, 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 a great open door Lord an effectual door that you have opened before us Lord we stand before a harvest of thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of souls Lord that you are sending your people into that harvest, Jesus. I pray, God, that you would adjust our perspective of ourselves, Lord, in who we are in your kingdom. You said it is your good pleasure to give us the kingdom, Lord. But we have to turn the key. We have to step on the gas. We have to go. We have to move forward. We have to labor together with you, Lord. I pray, God, that you would adjust our perspective, Jesus. Don't let us be weary. Don't let us be discouraged. Don't let us compare ourselves among ourselves. Help us to set our eyes like a flint and to look forward. Help us to set our hands on that plow. Help us to reach deep into that seed that you have put in our hands. Don't let us be distracted by what's to the left or what's to the right. Don't let us look behind anymore. But help us to look forward to forget those things which are behind and to press toward the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Lord, we do not know how much time there is left. We don't know if we'll finish living our earthly life out before you come or if you will come before that day, Lord. We just know what you've promised us. We know what you've said. We know what's been prophesied. We know what's been said through the gifts, Lord. Awaken us, Jesus. We Help us to be willing to give you our schedules. Help us to be willing to let you set our priorities. Help us to be willing to let you awaken us out of our sleep, Lord. God, fill our mouths as your witnesses. You've commissioned us as your witnesses. You've commissioned us as your ambassadors, Lord Jesus. You said, how shall they hear except they be a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent, Lord? You have sent us, Jesus. I don't want to show up empty-handed. I don't want to show up without any souls that I have influenced for you, Lord. Show us how obligated we are. Show us, Lord, how much is required of us, Lord Jesus. Break us free from our self-centeredness, Jesus. Break us free from our selfishness, Lord. Break us free from our busyness and awaken us to the midnight hour in which we live, Lord, that you are holding the door open, but it'll be you that closes the door when that season comes to an end. And you've invited us to step into this final season with you, Jesus. God, give us the anointing, Lord, to speak. God, give us the boldness to speak. Give us a focus, Lord, on the harvest.
this past week, a lot was put into us. And uh, we want to impart that to you. There are certain things that uh, you hear and it just touches your heart. It really does. And it stays with you in your mind. So this is what I'm going to ask right now. I'm only going to keep you a few more minutes. So I'm really only going to keep you a few minutes here. I would like everyone that's under the age of 30 to raise your hand. Isn't that beautiful? we got some youth here under the age of 30. Well, I don't know. Sometimes they say youth can go up to 35, right? Or something like that. How about under the age of 35? Anybody under the age of 35 here? Okay. For everyone that's under the age of 35, I would like a nice line over here. <clears throat> And I would like Jeremiah chapter, what was it, chapter 8, verse 20. This is what hit me. Okay. And I like the elders and everyone. I'm, I'm talking about the elders. Anyone over the age of 35 to stand behind these youth. Okay. <clears throat> yes. This is what hit me. Okay. The harvest is past. The summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. This is God speaking here through Jeremiah. I am black. Astonishment has taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Balm is a healing resin that comes from the terebinth trees, and there was a, a ton of it in Gilead. And they used it for healing, to put on wounds. Is there no physician there? There were many physicians. Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? We have the balm of Gilead here in the Holy Ghost. You have the Spirit of God. You have healing in your hands. You have healing in your hands. We have Jesus. He is the great physician. He is the great physician. And in John chapter 9 verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. We have the healing balm of Gilead in our hands. The church of the living God. The daughter of our people is out there. They're hurting. You hear their cries. You can hear their cries. And we have the healing virtue of God in our hands. We can speak words of eternal life to those that are lost and dying. We can do that. We can do that. I want to tell that to our youth. We can do that. You don't have to let the devil tempt you and pull you out. This is one thing that was said. There was three on, on the youth. Three out of four lose out with God. They turn their back on God. Three out of four. I'm going to say, you are in a church that says, not on our watch. You're not going to lose out with God. We got you covered. We, we got prayer for you. We got a prayer covering for you. You don't have to leave. You can get closer and deeper with God. Oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. We're going to impart some power in you t today. We, got, we are going to impart the Holy Ghost and fire in you. And you can have that fire wherever you go. We got, mm, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can receive it this morning. And if you need a refilling, you can receive it this morning. And you will receive it if you, you raise your hands. Could you raise your hands while we pray for you? Go ahead, youth. 
Raise your hands. We're going to pray for you right now that God will refill you and infill you and give you power from on high in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray for the youth.